Hey church, I hope that you've had a good Wednesday today. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight for our midweek Bible study. It's good to uh, get together, uh, even virtually, and uh, spend some time in God's Word and uh, praying together uh, and walking through our continued study in Acts. So we'll be in Acts chapter 9 tonight uh, uh, and read most of the chapter together and uh, focus especially uh, on the conversion of Saul and that story of what happens on the road to Damascus. I hope that you've had a chance to pull up, uh, maybe even already pray for the folks on our prayer sheet tonight. Um, if you haven't done that, uh, you can even pause me and do that or, or do that after, after we're finished up. Uh, but I, I know that uh, it means so much to those folks for you to take moments to pray for them. If the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus is the hinge on which the great door of history swung open at last, uh, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus was the moment when all the ancient promises of God uh, gathered themselves up and rolled themselves into a ball and came flying uh, through that open door and out into the wide world beyond. The story was so important to Luke that he tells it uh, three times. Uh, he tells it here in Acts chapter 9, but then he records it again from Paul's lips in chapters 22 and chapters 26. And we see that from Luke several times throughout the book of Acts. Um, in fact, early on in these first eight chapters, we've seen essentially the same message um, from uh, sometimes the same people, but from a few people who have preached the same thing in front of much the same people. Uh, but this message is so important that Luke repeats it over and over again, and he's going to repeat over and over and over again uh, the message of how Saul uh, meets Jesus and what happens on that road. Uh, on the way to Damascus. Everything that Saul said and did from that moment on, and particularly everything that he wrote, flowed from that sudden, shocking moment, experience, seeing of Jesus. As you look back on your spiritual life, what one or two events in your spiritual life seem the most significant? Which of them seem the most significant in your life? And what is it about them that makes them stand out? Saul of Tarsus had been active and, and an approving witness to the stoning of Stephen. We talked about that last week. Uh, Paul, uh, Saul was highly intelligent, superbly educated, supremely biblically literate. Let's uh, just read the beginning of this chapter together. We'll pick it up in, uh, in the beginning of chapter 9 and read through verse 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they had heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to, into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So if we put ourselves in the place of Saul on our way to Damascus, knowing what we're going there for, what our goal has been, all along recently. Um, we are highly educated. We're highly biblically literate. Uh, we know the Old Testament like the back of our hand. Uh, we're intelligent. We're zealous. Uh, we feel like we are fulfilling what God has shown us that we are supposed to do. Then what is our intention uh, as uh, we are walking, of course, on our way to Damascus? What is our attention and what are the emotions that are stirring up inside of us on our way? And then what happens in the midst of this amazing moment, uh, this unexplainable moment really, and what emotions are stirring inside of us then? And still putting ourselves in the place of Saul, what shocking things do we see and, and do we hear as this happens? Saul had been persecuting uh, Christian believers and and the way that Jesus puts that to him as he communicates with him and as the people around Saul hear this voice too is that Jesus tells uh, Saul that 
that he is persecuting him. It doesn't say that he's persecuting other believers. That, in fact, that fact is known, of course, but he says that he's persecuting him. Of course, meaning that uh, that what, what Saul is doing to these believers of Jesus, he's doing to Jesus himself. We are reminded of the words um, from Matthew 25 where uh, Jesus talks about uh, feeding the hungry, and when we have fed the hungry, then, then, then we, <clears throat> then, then we have fed him. And if we if we clothe the naked, then we have clothed him. Um, and and if we have ignored the hungry, then we have ignored him. And if we have ignored the naked, then we have ignored him. And on and on and on. You remember the passage from Matthew twenty five, and that is very much akin to what Jesus uh, is saying to Saul here too. Verses 8 and 9 reveal Saul's physical state as he went to Damascus and over the next three days. Of course, he can't see anything. Uh, as the scripture tells us in that, as at the end of that passage that we just read, that he hasn't eaten anything or drank anything during that time too. Um, and if we put ourselves in Saul's place, what in the world are we thinking at that time? What is, what is going through our mind? What are, we, what are we experiencing? During Saul's time, Jews would meditate on the different phases of the great vision of Ezekiel 1, in which the prophet sees four-faced angels carrying something like a great chariot with wheels and flashing lights and wheels inside of wheels, and then a great dome and an expanse above. You can go back and read Ezekiel 1 if you want to be reminded of that. Finally, careful not to actually say that he saw God, the prophet describes a voice and a figure like a man, which had the appearance and the likeness of the glory of God. We don't know for sure, but several scholars have suggested that Saul might have been engaging in this meditation on the way to Damascus, preparing himself to act with violence against the Christians for the glory of God, keeping his heart focused on the divine throne chariot, seeing the angels and the wills, the lights, until possibly, hopefully, he might see the glory, the face. And then as he goes through this meditation process, maybe, we don't know for sure, but as he does this, as as uh, as as Jewish people tend to do during this time. As he gets to the face, as he hopes to see the glory of the face, the face was the face of Jesus. And imagine for somebody who is, as Paul describes himself, uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews, the shock, the terror, the horror, the glory, the shame, the all dramatically intermixed would have completely upturned Saul's expectation, undoing everything that he had really built his life upon in one single moment. When has God overturned your expectations in a surprising, maybe even a shocking way? When has he done that? When has he done something that just absolutely surprised you and turned your expectations or your assumptions maybe about him or about somebody else upside down? We'll pick it up again in verse 10. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias... He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is an instrument who I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem among those who invoked his name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. After some time had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night so that they might kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. 
When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and described for them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and argued with the Hellenists, but they were attempting to kill him. When the believers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Meanwhile, the church throughout, the Ju throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up, living in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. What is daunting about the assignment that the Lord gives Ananias? He's telling him to go, to go and to be around this person that he knows about, who is clearly persecuted, who is clearly, if not, if not, if he hasn't killed somebody himself, he certainly has stood by, encouraged it, approved of it, had no problems with it. Scripture tells us that. And now the Lord has come to Ananias and told him to go to this person. Think of a daunting assignment that you've received from the Lord. Uh, something that just seemed bigger than you. Something that seemed uh, scary, maybe. What objections did you raise? We don't know. We don't have any idea how Ananias became a follower of Jesus. After, after this scripture passage, we never hear of him again in scripture at all. What we do know is that he was a believer, that he knew how to listen for the voice of Jesus. That's very clear. That he was prepared to obey uh, that voice of Jesus, even though it seemed ridiculously dangerous. That he went where he was sent and did what he was told, and did it with love and grace and wisdom. Can't ask for more than that. What is Ananias told will be Paul's mission and the consequences of that mission? Paul is going to, of course, uh, that God is going to use him uh, to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. The Lord is calling Saul for a particular task. The person is to do this task, to spearhead the work of uh, getting the message out to those, uh, to getting the message to those that are outside the law, uh, must be the one who most clearly of all others of his generation had been the most keen to stomp out that message. When you want to reach the pagan world, the person to do it will be a hardline, fanatical, ultra-nationalist, super-orthodox, Pharisaic Jew. And some say that God doesn't have a sense of humor. We trace Saul's activity and movements after his conversion. What does he keep on? Why does he keep on the move? Because people are after him. Uh, the people that he was trying to persecute for are now trying to persecute him. And Barnabas intervenes on his behalf because, as we know, uh, word spreads about things, and word spreads about things in the ancient world too. And so word is spread about Saul and what he's done and what he was doing to Christians. And so uh, the folks who are in Jerusalem don't want to have anything to do with him. They're afraid it's a, a trick, um, that somehow he's going to uh, say these things just so that he can be around them and then round them up in one fell swoop. And then, of course, they send Saul to Tarsus for his safety, for his life. So I want us to think about a question. We're going to wrap up in just a second. We'll finish the rest of chapter 9 next week. But I want us to think about a question. Of the unbelievers that you know, who seems the least likely to become a follower of Jesus? Of the unbelievers you know, who seems the least likely to become a follower of Jesus? There's a follow-up question to that. How will you pray for that person? How will you do that? And will you commit to doing that? May we pray for those who, like Saul, would not be considered likely candidates to become followers of Christ, let alone leaders in announcing the message. Pray also that we might serve as an Ananias, obeying the Lord in the face of danger, and as a Barnabas, speaking up, for whom someone who for whom others suspect pray for that person that you think is least likely to become a follower of Jesus because as we all know life and god surprises us let's pray together god we thank you for this time that you've given us to open your word and to study it lord we pray that uh 
in the people and in the world around us that we wouldn't just write people off. That we wouldn't write them off as never having any, that there's no chance that they would ever follow Jesus. Help us not to do that. Help us to live with open hearts and open minds and open doors. Help us to love people in the midst of the differences they may have, even, even if those are great differences, and let you sort things out. God, we pray for those on our prayer list, that you would be with them in their situations, and their struggles, and their trials, whether those be physical or spiritual or mental, whatever they might be, God, we pray that you would be with them. We praise you for all that you do in our lives, God. We know that it's very easy for our prayer time just to turn into a time of petitions, but God, we know that we have much to praise you for too. Remind us, God, of all that we have to be thankful for. We pray that you would be with us the rest of this week. Give us opportunities to share your love, to share your message of hope with the world around us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Well, I want to remind you, you can join us in person or online um, on Sunday morning. Uh, we look forward to seeing you either either of those ways. If you are coming in person, I do want to invite you uh, to help decorate right after church on Sunday morning. Um, we uh, normally would uh, order some lunch and have some pizza and eat and then decorate, but uh, this year, obviously, with COVID, it's not the right uh, time or place to do that. And so right after church this Sunday, we'll start decorating. And if you can join us, uh, we'll, we'll certainly be, be happy uh, for any help we can get. I look forward to seeing you Sunday, either in person or online. Have a great rest of the week. God bless you.